Welcome to Flying's first ever virtual event. I'm Craig Fuller. I'm the new owner and CEO of Flying Magazine. I'm excited to have you here and really excited to have this next conversation. We're going to dive into the future of aviation and specifically a talk about electric propulsion. So with me today is the CEO of Magnets. Roy, welcome. Uh, thank you. It's uh, pronounced Magni X. So if you want to do that, uh, <laughs> just for later on. Magni X. So tell us a little bit about the background of Magni X. Uh, Magni X is a company that started back in 2009 in Australia doing R&D on electric motors. Actually, nothing to do with aerospace, just in general, the various topologies and architectures of how do we make electric motors better. And then in 2017, we developed what ended up being our aerospace prototype, phenomenally powerful, very lightweight, turning at really low speeds. And that kind of lent itself well to going into aerospace and revolutionizing an industry that has been long uh, due for a revolution. Uh, and so early 2018, we pivoted the company from general R&D to specific commercial focus on electrifying commercial aviation. And the rest of the last three and a half years, as they say, is history. Uh, we've been flying e-beavers, e-caravans, et cetera, uh, for over a year and a half now, uh, and have uh, just recently started working on a 40-passenger all-electric aircraft as well. So uh, there's a lot of controversy, or not controversy, but a lot of conversation about electric propulsion. There is some controversy, but most of it's about when the regulators or how the regulators are going to accept or not accept electric propulsion. Can you dive into sort of your thesis on when are we going to see this technology and what is the current state of sort of the regulatory environment? When you look at uh, electric aviation, there's two points uh, to really focus on. One, can it be done physically? And two, can it be certified? So they're kind of the two points, right? One is more of a regulatory uh, environment. The other is more of a physics and physical environment. To the first, the physical environment, the biggest challenge today that people like to talk about, especially the naysayers, they love to bring up the fact that batteries or fuel cells don't have enough energy or power to actually fly an airplane equivalent to fuel. And to that, I say they're absolutely right. Uh, we are not competing with fuel. Batteries or fuel cells will never compete with fuel. But the question isn't, is an electric plane as good as a fuel plane? The question is, is an electric plane good enough for what it needs to do? And so take, for example, a beaver. We have electrified a beaver. We started flying back in December 2019. It's a five passenger plus pilot plane flown in this case by Harbor Air, which is their mainstay of their fleet up in Vancouver, Canada. Their flights are average of 50 to 75 miles. So a converted beaver that's restricted to about 150 miles actually serves them well. It can't fly as far as the gas-based beaver, which can go up to about 750 miles, I believe, max range. But no one flies a beaver 750 miles. They fly them 50, 75 miles. And so it really fits well. Are we going to do Seattle, New York flights or New York to London flights anytime soon on electric? No, not even close. We're also not going to do a 737-sized aircraft anytime soon electric. But when you look at that niche of up to about 100 miles with a retrofit or up to about 400 miles with a dedicated aircraft, meaning an aircraft designed to be electric, like the Eviation Alice, for example, that niche, if you will, covers quite a bit of market. And so physically it can be done with today's batteries and fuel cells. Is it a goal to really usher in the urban air mobility sector, or is it something more intermediate uh, of retrofitting the existing sort of commercial aircraft that we see in the market? When you look at the market, you can really split it into three. One is all the flights that are more than a thousand miles in range. Seattle to New York, New York to London, uh, LA, Tokyo. That's never going to be done electric, not in the next 40, 50 years. It's just not possible. Uh, you couldn't get enough batteries or fuel cells to do it. Maybe, you no, know, hopefully we'll see more use of SAF, uh, maybe even liquid hydrogen, but definitely not electric. The other side of the market is, to your point, the urban air mobility. It's the sub 50 mile flights, the helicopter replacement that will fly me from the office to, you know, the, the parking lot, et cetera. I don't think that model will happen, at least not in the next 15 years. What we will see in the next few years as they become certified eventually is a replacement for a helicopter. So man, the outskirts of Manhattan to JFK, for example, uh, LAX airport to another helipad. So that we may see. Again, I think it'll be more for the wealthier uh, or corporate types. It won't be the air taxi that everyone's talking about. But that's that second part. 
Where we're focused on is Magni X is the third part, which we also like to call the most boring part of aviation. It's a fixed wing aircraft taking off from an airport and landing in an airport. Flies like a plane, looks like a plane, operates like a plane, except it's electric, which means it's 50% at least lower cost per flight hour and zero emission. And so we're not working on the urban air mobility part of it, nor are we looking at the long range. We're looking at the most practical part of how do you usher in the electric aviation in the most practical and quickest way possible. And that is to take two things. One, the ability to retrofit existing planes in that market space, such as the de Havilland Beaver, the Cessna Grand Caravan, aircraft like that. And the second is to support new aircraft OEMs like Aviation Alice or Faraday who are designing from scratch airplanes to be electric. So that's the market that we're focused on. So total cost of ownership and total cost of per hour. Uh, can we sort of talk a little bit about where the advantages are? It strikes me that the TCO on the front end is, or there's a significant capital CapEx expenditure to, to re retrofit these vehicles. That is, is that something correct? So if you're looking at a retrofit, then yes, there, there's a significant investment compared to, for example, buying a Lycoming or a Continental piston engine, right? An electric motor will be significantly more expensive. But then you're looking at 50 to 80% lower operating costs per hour. And that's on a retrofit. If you're buying a new aircraft, the cost of buying that aircraft, there is a slight premium over a regular plane, but it's not significant. But your savings are still that 50 to 80% per flight hour, in addition to the fact that, of course, there's zero emission. And so these savings come from really two main parts, and then there's a third kind of a uh, added uh, second derivative. The first is, of course, electricity is much cheaper than fuel, significantly cheaper. As an example, when we flew a Cessna Grand Caravan for an hour and a half flight, that's about $420 plus in fuel. Actually, that was last year's uh, prices. Fuel has gone up, and as we've seen, oil prices have gone up but let's say $420 plus for an hour and a half flight just in fuel, $24 in electricity. Let's say I'm double wrong on the electricity and we go to some place that's double the price, $48 in electricity compared to 400. Let's say I'm triple wrong, $80 an hour uh, and a half. It's still, you know, tenfold cheaper than fuel. The second part is maintenance. A regular, let's say turbine engine, operating at the 850 horsepower range that we do the Caravan or the Beaver, operates at about 10 to 15, maybe even 20,000 RPM. Our motor turns at 1,900 RPM, same as the prop. Direct to propeller, no gearbox, no wear and tear like a 20,000 RPM motor does. The turbine operates at 850 degrees Celsius. We operate at 80 degrees Celsius. The turbine has multiple moving parts in it that are all delicate and have to be in balance. We have one moving part. And so when you look at wear and tear, maintenance, uh, elements like that, where can things go wrong, there's not much that can go wrong in an electric motor. When's the last time you fixed your washing, your washing machine or your blender? These things just work. And so from that perspective, the maintenance costs are significantly lower. They're not going to be zero because the FAA won't allow us to do zero, but they'll be significantly lower. And then the third part, which is kind of the second derivative fuel of the maintenance is, if you're a commercial operator of planes, anytime you take your plane into maintenance, that's not a plane that's producing revenue for you. So you have lost opportunity costs. So then you either need another plane or another engine. If you hardly have any maintenance or service on an electric propulsion system, your plane is in service longer. And so from that perspective, that's another added advantage. So one of the other things I hear, there's two other sort of topics, and let's dive into each of these. One is the weight is the weight of the batteries is, is heavy. How do you address that? Yeah, so you address that with performance. That's the reason a retrofitted Beaver can only do 100, 150 miles versus the 700 miles. It's because the weight of the fuel isn't there, so you can only replace the weight of the fuel and the engine with the weight of the batteries, and so you get less performance. So that's the counter, right? So it's not like the plane is heavier, because especially on a retrofit, max weight is max weight. And so what you do is you take out the engine, you take out the fuel system, and that's the weight you have to play with. And so because you are limited, you can put less batteries in, and so you get less range. That's on a retrofit. But if you look at an aircraft, a new design aircraft, like the Aviation Alice, for example, and the reason I mentioned that is uh, that's a nine-passenger, all-composite, fly-by-wire electric airplane 
that's about to start flying here towards the end of this year. That for nine passengers is a 16 and a half thousand pound aircraft with 8,500 pounds of battery. And so how do you make an electric plane get a range of 440 nautical? You make it a flying battery. So imagine a, a plane where half of your weight is battery. There's no CG problems there. It never changes throughout the flight. You can move around the cabin and sit anywhere you want and there's no issue. So the entire, basically the entire plane is a giant battery, which is pretty brilliant. I think, you know, we've seen some of the sort of more modern, the Teslas, for instance, have the batteries sort of throughout the vehicle. The entire floor. I, yeah, exactly. I have to I mean, ask, because this also gets brought up, is stability of the batteries. We have seen these videos of Teslas catching fire. There's been the, the old uh, Samsung Galaxy that would randomly catch fire. We know lithium ion is, is an instable, uh, you know, an instable uh, uh, molecule or instable construction. Can you talk a little bit about how you're sort of addressing that? I think the last thing a pilot wants to deal with is a fire in, in the sky. You know, th that's interesting you say that. You're right. The last thing a pilot wants to deal with is fire in the sky. And yet, uh, if you're an alien landing on Earth and asking, hey, how do you guys fly around? And you say, well, we go into this metal tube and we fill it with a really, really combustible, flammable liquid. And then we light the liquid. And that's how we fly around. That alien would turn around, get on their spaceship and get out of this planet, right? I mean, but we never ask about what about fires in a fuel based plane, in a jet? There's a reason you can't smoke next to these things or light a match next to them, right? And yet no one asks questions about the explosions or flammabilities of a fuel based airplane because we've gotten used to the fact that there are safety measures in place. There are things that we do in order to ensure uh, the limited flammability or limited expansion of that flammability. But these things blow up, and there's a reason when there's a plane accident, unfortunately, you see a huge ball of fire. Uh, there's a reason when military planes or any plane has to land right after takeoff, they have to go around and dump fuel, right? Because you don't want to land with a belly full of fuel. Batteries are, are going to be no different from the sense that there are regulations that define the level of flammability, the risk, how do you maintain uh, uh, the propagation, et cetera, if, God forbid, something were to happen? And so there are multiple regulations by the FAA or EAS or any other regulatory authority that we will have to go through before we can ever make this a, a commercial offering. So that's kind of on, on the one sense. On the other, yes, lithium ion today is the most, uh, I'll call it expansive battery that exists today, especially for airplanes, but it's also b getting better and better in terms of how do we package it? And two, the next technologies of batteries coming about, lithium sulfur, lithium metal, solid state, are even less flammable than the lithium ion. And so from that perspective, I don't think that's a concern at all. And people shouldn't be concerned about it as long as they're not concerned flying in a plane full of liquid fuel. Yeah, it's you make a very interesting point and a very logical argument, and I, I can buy that. One of the things that also gets brought up is the temperature. You know, obviously in the air, we all know this as pilots. The higher you go, the colder it gets. How do you keep a battery that is, if your whole fuselage is built around this battery, how do you keep it warm enough? Because temperature does degrade battery performance. So actually the only concern with battery temperature is when it's on the ground, not being used. So a plane is overnight in the hangar or outside, it gets cold in the winter, northern the US, and how does it start up because it loses some range? When that battery starts to work, you know, when's the last time you put your phone next to your ear? it warms up, right? Batteries create heat when they operate, when they're, when an energy is being pulled or inserted. And so from that perspective, once the airplane starts flying, there's not a concern of temperature because those batteries will maintain their heat. It's really when it's on the ground. And so that's one part of the answer. The second is that if you look at most electric planes, especially the larger commercial ones, like what we work on, the battery system and the propulsion system are all liquid cooled. So there's a active cooling capability or active temperature management, thermal management capability for these systems that allow you to maintain that throughout altitude and throughout ambient temperatures. Man, you, this has been an awesome conversation. Got to ask, you guys venture capital funded or what's the capital situation of the business? Uh, Magniex is 100% owned by a group out of Singapore called Claremont Group that completely funds the business to a success. That's awesome. Well, congratulations. I imagine that uh, VCs will be love to talk to you at some point because it sounds like a great story. Uh, it's an exciting time. I always ask folks this, 
tell me your favorite aircraft that's in the sky. What is it your, you think is the most beautiful aircraft? You could own one aircraft, what would it be? The Apache helicopter. Best okay. invented helicopter and aircraft ever built. Saved my life a few times, and I just love it. That's awesome. Well, very good. Really appreciate your time today. Be sure to uh, stay tuned for the content. We have more coming up, so don't go anywhere. Thank you very much.